Let's do an exercise in theorycraft. Anyone can theorycraft. It's one of the best things about fictional media. It can also be daunting in certain spaces, but really, all you need is a convincing argument, a theory that's built up with supporting claims and evidence. I'm going to build up a convincing theory just enough to tear it down. Spoilers for all of Dark Souls 2, by the way, and for a 19th century poem, I guess. The lore of the Dark Souls series is touted as rich and complex, with several channels of YouTube almost solely dedicated to, if not built upon, deciphering it. It is a world and story that needs explanation. Part of this need, however, stems not from said complexity, but from the means of delivery and obscurity. The games will tell you their own stories, the narrative of what's going on in the present as you act, and, when not making a point to keep you in the dark, why. What they obscure is history, the lore of the past, the dead kingdoms, ancient rites, forgotten cultures. The method of delivery for the deep lore is in the description of items and their relation to some of the difficult-to-parse lines of dialogue with various NPCs. The magic is that it makes the player an archaeologist of sorts. We put together stories with what we have and are rarely left with a complete picture. Often, the deep lore requires deep speculation. Nothing is confirmed. We're about to go into something I'd consider the deepest lore, accompanied with the deepest speculation. We're diving into inspirations and references, that is, connections to elements from outside the text that shape the game. This isn't going to be the same as headcanon, and I'm not just saying that to distance from the term, more so that it's not really a lore theory with respect to in-game canon so much as it is a theory of creator inspiration. Additional to that, I know these games are translated works and have some manner of differing between them, but it is still a piece of media as it is, ideal translation or no. All this means is I cannot pinpoint where exactly in the process of creation these references made their way in. It might be an English-only thing. It might be across every iteration. I cannot say. Doubtless, the stories of Arthurian myth have seeped into nearly all of Western-focused fantasy. From Excalibur swords to grail hunts to cursed withering lands tied to the physical strength of a king, the signs are plentiful. Dark Souls is no exception. Despite its Japanese origin, the setting is clearly inspired by Western medieval renaissance and mythical designs. Before moving forward, let's highlight the difference between reference and cultural osmosis. Here's a Dark Souls lore significant example of what I mean. Gwyn is a real-world name with origins in mythology, as is Guinevere. I do not think these names are used as a direct reference within Dark Souls 1, I think they are calls to the archaic, the legendary, but in a decidedly western mythological fashion. Gwyn sounds kingly. Guinevere is magical. To that point, imagine if Gwyn in Dark Souls 1 was named Philip, Lord of Cinder, or even Henry or Edward. The names used must have an air of myth about them to feel not awkward in their use. Given that the names weren't chosen as a direct reference, the osmosis path of Gwen equals Kingly is what we're left with. Okay, moving on. The Lady of Shalott is an 1842 poem by Alfred Tennyson, a telling of a tale of Camelot, Arthurian legend. I believe it has a strong connection to one of the core characters of Dark Souls 2. Let me explain the poem briefly, as well as leave a link in the description for those who want to pause and go read. The Lady of Shalott is cursed. She is forbidden from looking directly upon the world outside her tower, that is, through a window, for example. As such, she spends her time weaving depictions of what she sees through a mirror, through reflections she refers to as shadows. Her undoing comes when she looks upon Camelot directly, enticed by the image of Lancelot through the mirror, particularly his helm and feather. Her curse is vague in both cause and impact, 
punishing her with a withering death. In her final moments, she writes her title, The Lady of Shalott, upon a boat, and pushes herself from the shore to drift to Camelot, where onlookers notice as her boat beaches. Among them is Lancelot, who more or less says she's pretty, though she arrived dead. And now, onto some base assumptions for my argument. Here are three things I believe we can safely take as a baseline. Number one, her name is not simply an anagram of Seath Talon. This is a fun idea, but I'm not really sure it goes very far. I only mention it because it could explain away her weird name. Number two, the developers know Arthurian myth and, though referencing it broadly as most fantasy does, have intentionally referenced it here. And number three, this poem is specifically referenced, not just the myth it entails. The last point may need some elaboration. As stated before, the poem I'm tying my theory to is about a shared myth, not something Tennyson made up from whole cloth. So why this poem over all other versions? The myth itself is quite fungible. The name for the central figure, in Tennyson's case the Lady of Shalott, differs from version to version. The myth is known as Donna di Scarlotta in Italian and Elaine and Lancelot in older English iterations. Speaking simply, the Lady of Shalott, Tennyson's work, is of particular significance because it is unique to Tennyson in emphasizing Shalott as a signifier of the subject because Shalott is unique to Tennyson's poem. It's a name that is only used in his work, a work which, in turn, gives the lady no other name. Shalott does not mean anything. It is not a word like Scarlotta slash Scarlotto in Italian. English has no other use of Shalott, aside from proximity to Shalot, which is a wholly different word. If he, Tennyson, owns the word, then any work that references Shalott inevitably derives from his telling of the myth. Once this baseline is established, one can delve into the myth through the lens of this poem and note several connections to elements that are absent in other tellings of the myth, firming up the connection between Dark Souls 2 and Tennyson in specific. Initially, the story of the Lady of Shalott came to mind because of a character and naming trend unique to Dark Souls 2. There is a character that serves as your guide, in a sense, called the Emerald Herald, later given the name Shanelot. In this same game, there are a series of queens seeking respective monarchs that all share one trait in each of their names. The syllable Na is common to all of them. Nashandra, Ilana, Nadalia, Alsana, and, as such, Shanelot. Another note is that each of the Na characters are essentially left with a name either without the Na or adjacent to it. Elana, Elaine, Nadalia, Dahlia, Alsana, Elsa, and finally, the most obfuscated one, Nashandra, which is, in my view, like Sandra slash Cassandra, which, if you need some bonus circumstantial evidence, Cassandra is a name popularly taken to refer to the Greek myth, a figure whose curse involves prophecy, lies, and disbelief. If you remove the Na from Shanelot, the result is Shalot, a name with no other connection than to Tennyson. There are a few themes that come to mind as common between the Lady of Shalot, referred to as Shalot from now on, and Shanelot. These themes are indirect viewing, sequestration, mirrors, and longing. An incidental connection could also be made between her weaving and the theory of the old yarn spinner in the intro as also being Shanelot, but I don't have a ton beyond that to say about it. The strongest elements of her connection center on two aspects of Shanelot, her manifestations and her true physical position in the game. Made clearer in translation, though still present in the English version of Dark Souls, is the principal understanding that the true Shanelot is found in the Dragon Airy, far from where we first meet her, where she speaks of having guided the player through her Bunshin, which translates as avatars or embodiments. There are two possibilities here. She likely means either the herald in Majula is a Bunshin slash manifestation, 
or she is speaking of the old woman in the introduction. But the theories are not mutually exclusive. The important part is that we have never met the real her before now, and have certainly met manifestations before. Her manifestations are how she sees the world while remaining in the airy. Manifestations may also be understood as reflections of the self, a power that is never explained but possibly comes from her creator, Altia, who was also working on magic mirrors. Shanelot is in the airy, which is separated from the world by both an impossible transition and Aldia's keep. He made her, and he keeps her there, which is admittedly more of a backstory than we are given with Tennyson and the Lady of Shalot. The key item she gives to the player, an aged feather, touches on her cloistering in its description, stating, The key item she gives the player, an aged feather, touches on her cloistering in its description, stating, the child of the dragon, sequestered away from the world, imagined a world of boundless possibilities from the mere sight of a feather. In this description, we are given no temporal grounding. We are not told when her sequestration and isolation ended, or indeed, if it ever has. Shanelot, like Shalot, is set in a distant place, overlooking a kingdom through reflections. These reflections are her manifestations, her shadows. The reflections in the poem are from a literal mirror, and referred to as being shadows. If anything, the point should be used primarily to emphasize the unique nature of Airy Shanelot as compared to the others, which are, in my view, all manifestations, reflections, shadows. She, too, thus views her world through shadows, much like Shalot. Shalot does not, however, manifest herself out into the world so much as bring the world to her, using a mirror as her lens. Which brings us to mirrors. Mirrors are not a common occurrence in Dark Souls. Thematically, they lay outside the ordinary realm of the stories of cycles, reiterations, decay, and inevitability. They are often evoked in literature to be metaphors for, or allusions to, self-exploration. Dark Souls is uniquely uninterested in the self. Even as the next monarch, even as the chosen undead, we are empty in our past, empty in our future, and ultimately only potentially next so much as we fill the role, only chosen in so much as any undead forced to Lordran who leaves the asylum fits the prophecy. There is hardly a self in Dark Souls. One of the themes of two is, indeed, the loss of anchors to the world in memory, sense of self, the unraveling that the curse of the undead casts. Much like the poem, the world of Dark Souls starts after the curse. It is not a world that cares what was forgotten or lost before it starts, and it always starts us with nothing substantial. And yet, mirrors curiously feature into Dark Souls too, though it would be a stretch to claim they do so as some thematic grandstand. If anything, I take them to be displays of reflections, and also as a partial allusion to Tennyson's work when the poem says, and sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights come riding two and two. This, if nothing else, at least reminds me of, and perhaps inspired the mirror phantoms in Looking Glass Night, though few connections can be made to Shanelot, beyond her potential learning of reflection manifestation under Aldia. Mirrors and viewing the world through reflections is perhaps the most central element of Tennyson's poem, but they are not as crucial to Dark Souls 2 as they are the poem. But Bear in mind that Dark Souls 2 is not Shanelot's story, and that mutual significance of reflection remains for her and Tennyson's story. Shalot in the poem is envious of the world she sees through her mirror, of all Camelot, and has been, presumably, for the whole of her life before the poem began. The poem is the story of her faltered will, the moment that she fails and the curse plays out. We do not see it cast, we do not know her prior temptations, we do not know of the times she nearly faltered. We only see the moment that she fails, and with it, the vision that manages to tempt her, Lancelot, a knight, bold and bright with his feather and helm. Contrast this with the aforementioned unnamed knights who ride through her mirror. They do not tempt her as he does. He is the object of her fascination to such a point that it kills her. To say she sought anything prior to the activation of her curse might be a stretch. We are not given a glimpse into her goals or the world surrounding her, the nature of the curse, etc. 
we are only left knowing one thing for certain. Though she had Camelot in her sight for all of her confinement, it was not the beauty of the land or the customs of its people or even the desire to belong or simply be somewhere else that tempted her to a point of failure. It was Lancelot. We watch desire materialize, stronger than the infinite temptations of the past that we are only given faint assurance must have happened. What does Shanelot desire? Put simply, a monarch. She guides the player towards the end goal. There is no explicit mention of her desire. She does not seek a pairing like the other Na characters. This game doesn't really deal with brides in any explicit terms that go beyond the queens. There's no player marriage or anything. Our bond with the hypothetical fifth queen is not so formal, even as a potential monarch. There's a trust and degrees of affirmation, but no oath or any kind of union. It is implied she was made to serve the purpose of a firekeeper in a land that no longer has them. By extension, her purpose would be to tend to the flame and work to keep the dying world alive. I do not know if that's her actual motive. It's possible she just wants to be free, as the feather suggests, and that she's tied to her role like Shalot is to the curse. In Dark Souls, we never get to know some things, and that includes character motivations and what a saved world even means or looks like. Most of what we know and think about characters is built on assumptions, but what we build is less a figure of the character and more a stack of lore blocks resembling the shape of the character waiting to get kicked over. Which leads us to... Despite everything I've just said, I cannot prove a Thing. Cultural osmosis can easily put a stake through the heart of the theory. Tennyson is not the only writer out there to think about themes of isolation and desire in a fantasy setting. I could have centered this more on someone like Rapunzel. I had to more or less ignore things or say the parallel stops right at Shanelot's most memorable acts of desire and defiance. I mean, all I truly have to go off is that her name, when you filter it through another game-related name theory, becomes very similar, though not identical to, a character with some shared traits. Most supporting evidence has no guaranteed connection that can't just be waved away by cultural osmosis. It could be just a name, the same as Gwyn. So in the end, do I believe that Dark Souls 2 is built upon the worlds of Alfred Tennyson? I wish, but no. Do I think Shanelot is a Tennyson reference? Kinda. Do I think about it every time I see the character? Absolutely. It's a pet theory, and I think serves as a good example for how to expand upon an interpretation. Hell, cultural osmosis is basically how Dark Souls 1 even happened. Miyazaki, the director, more or less said his inspiration came from a time when he couldn't even read what he was enamored with. It's more than fair to say that images and elements of these games exist by way of impressions and extensions. All of this to say, have fun with theories, take them seriously. That's not an oxymoron. Where part of the game is fun for the challenge, both in technical combat skill and in deciphering the story, the rest is in making connections yourself, building ideas, believing things that are interesting, because that's all we really have for sure sometimes. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Um, it's a noticeably shorter one this time, which I think is a good thing. I don't really intend on dropping longer content in general, but I thought a short one would be fun. I also thought it would be fun to have one that wasn't about politics or colonialism. Um, let me know your thoughts on it. I think the next one's gonna be about the CIA, but like, kind of in a funny way? I don't know. Uh, we'll see. I get to do the thing where I put up the links to other videos I've done, which is new because this will be literally all of them on one screen, which is kind of neat. Um, if you liked this one, consider watching the other two, maybe. I don't know. Bye.